Thank you, Corey, and welcome everyone to our fellowship service this afternoon. So happy to see everyone. I know we have several, several regular people who are off doing other things this afternoon, but um, I also see new faces, so that's great. <laughs> um, welcome, welcome, welcome everyone who's watching virtually as well. Um, let, let us begin together with our Prayer of the Child of Love song. Please stand, and it's right on the front of your songbook. Father, Mother, God, your kingdom come, your holy will be holy done. Spirit, source of love, you flow through me, your loving child, eternally. Every day, in every way, amen. Every day, I will pray. Your kingdom come, your holy will be holy done. Spirit, source of love, you flow through me. Your loving child, eternally, everywhere. Let love be there. Amen. Everywhere, this is my prayer again. Father, Mother, God, your kingdom come, your holy will be holy. 
done. Spirit, source of love, you flow through me. Your loving child, eternally. Please be seated. you to close your eyes and begin to relax. Let your shoulders drop and soften your jaw. And let's lay down all of our thinking and doing and planning, being and worrying for these few moments of meditation. Let's bring our full awareness to the one divine presence. The loving presence that we live, move, and have our being in. In this moment, we remember and connect with our true nature, our divinity, love itself. Not a personal self, separate and alone, but one in union and harmony with all that is. May our collective energy be a beacon of light and a beacon of love around this planet, seen, felt, and experienced by all. We are so grateful for this time together, for each other, for our fellowship community. So grateful to know that in the deepest core of our being, all is well. And together we say, and so it is. Thank you so much. I'm going to introduce our very, very special music today, our new duo, Anara Pearl and Austin Kaufman. Please give them a warm welcome. Uh, it's good to be here while she's getting ready to play. Um, just want to say the very first song that we're going to do today is one that Anara wrote, and I'll let her introduce the song. Uh, this song is called Untied. Uh, it's about a book called The Bridge Home, about a poor family living in India, and two girls, sisters, run away from their abusive father, yeah, but living on the streets was a lot harder than they expected. The book is called The Bridge Home. Keep everything tight. 
have stood a chance and wove those beads into plans. Dreams of school, faith and hope could have found a life, built a home. We shouldn't dwell on dreams, cause we Eventually we split apart Everything would end before it started We did our best, God knows we've tried To keep everything tight You strung your beat Sleep, I count the bees like my own rosary. I did my best, God knows I tried, but our future came untied. You strung your beat. But all that's gone and dead and for prayer requests later in the service. Put those in the basket when it comes around during the collection and we will pray for those um, folks today and also put them on our prayer connection list. So we're going to sing another song together. Um, fellowship song. So I invite you to please stand if you're able and turn to page one. The Essence of Our Being. The essence of our being is spirit. The spirit of love unites us all. Can call it Allah, wisdom, peace, or love. Alpha and Omega, it's there if we but call. The essence of our being is spirit. This spirit, this source.
was life for all. We are all connected, our common thread is love, our spiritual expression, our source, our all in all. The essence of our being is spirit. The spirit of love unites us all. You can call it Allah, wisdom, peace, or love, Alpha and Omega, if there if we but call. The essence of our being is spirit. The spirit, the source of life for all. We are all connected. Our common thread is love. Our spiritual expression, our source, our all in all. Please stay. Oops. Standing, <laughs> and we can give each other hugs and handshakes. Squats are good for everybody. I <laughs> see. to uh, introduce our speaker this afternoon. He's been with us several times before. We've all enjoyed his messages. So please give Brett Kuhn a warm welcome. topic uh, today that if you knew me very well, you would say, what in the hell is he doing talking about this? <laughs> and the topic is uh, walking with a humble heart. So uh, my wife, I didn't tell her what I was talking about. She would have probably questioned me on that one as well. <laughs> but it's, there's some beauty in it. And um, my wife, she grew up in a family where she was adopted, and her adopted mom um, would quite often gaslight her. You know, she would say things and pretend like it didn't happen, and her brother was very intelligent. I don't know if he was on the genius status, but he was a very intelligent person. So she was constantly, constantly being diminished and belittled in some form or fashion, and... So when her and I got together, it was the perfect match for me to uh, be challenged on my, my arrogance, to be honest with you. I didn't realize I was arrogant for 
a long time. And she would tell me, you're being so arrogant, you know? And I go, I honestly don't know what I'm doing. I really don't know what I'm doing. And I'm like, okay, you're telling me I'm arrogant. And, and, and I guess I just have to trust you on that. But until I understand what that means, I don't know how to be any different. And so it was really such a button for her because of her family issues. And she kept challenging me and kind of getting in my face because it really drove her nuts, you know. And here I am being a, a, a minister and speaking at different places. And my, my son and her came to see me at quite a few of my different talks. And then I could see they're fidgety. They're not wanting to be there. like, please, just don't come see me anymore, you know. <laughs> just do us both a favor, you know. And, uh, you know, part of it, I'm sure, was because they had heard my story so many times and also because of my arrogance. I began to start to see how, um, really, truthfully, how I, insecure I really was. And I would say it's probably one of the reasons that this was the perfect um, position, field, job for me to have is to go out there and speak to people and because... I really wanted people to like me and approve of me. And I was being put in a very vulnerable situation where, quite frankly, sometimes they might not. And, you know, we've all heard the, the, uh, the stats where, you know, what's the biggest fear? That speaking is a fear that's bigger than death, right? People don't, they're not worrying about the death, but give me up there on the stage, you know, it's frightening to people. But I'm sure if somebody was pointing a gun at their had, they would probably give the best speech of their lives. I'm happy to give a talk, you know. Uh, so if they're put in that position. But, but it, it is a scary thing. But uh, the beautiful thing about it is, is it gives us an opportunity to continue to let go. And that's what's been happening for me more and more, where I have begun to see and understand of how I have been trying to prove my worth. I have been trying to become somebody. Somebody that people approve of, that like. And so, uh, you know, a lot of my identification uh, has been, uh, you know, to be a good speaker, to be a good meditation teacher, to, you know, retreat facilitator, whatever I'm doing. I hooked into that as a way of, you know, becoming somebody. When, my, uh, when I was growing up, my dad was in the Air Force, so we moved around a lot. And one of the ways for me to connect with other people was through sports. I was good at sports. So when we moved to another school, I got picked to be on the kickball team, you know, and I, that was the way I began to make friends and which was all fine. But then eventually you're building on a false foundation and eventually that false foundation is going to come down. And for me, what that looked like is about 15 years ago, I was meditating and um, I had this um, vision in my meditation that was very clear. It was a nuclear bomb going off. And I go, oh, God, what's, what's going to happen here? And um, I didn't know what was going to happen, but I started having fears. It, you know, is something going to happen to me, my wife, my son? And so um, I'm like, well, there's really nothing I can do about it. And a couple days later, a few days later, I don't remember how long, but uh, I was told in the meditation that I had cancer. And so um, I'm like, you know, I know we all kind of have certain guidance in here. Actually, everybody has plenty of guidance. It's rather we hear the words or the, the signals or symbols that God is always giving us. So um, I, I heard the words, but I thought, am I making this up in my head? I don't, if I am, I don't know why I would, but I better take this seriously. So I did, and I said, all right, God, I realize probably my biggest fear is what people think of me. And I feel like if there's anything that's creating an illness within my body, it's that. So I said, I'm ready to face my fear. Shortly after that, um, the um, baseball league called me up and said, you signed your son up for baseball, but we don't have a coach for your team. Would you be willing to coach? I'm like, yeah. You know, I had coached softball and co-ed intramurals in, um, at college, but coaching, not the children, but having parents that 
take the game rather seriously. Uh, it's like coaching children and having to deal with the parents and what they would think. That really challenged me. But I did take it and I ended up coaching my, my son for the, probably the next three or four years. But after I took that position, Spirit came to me shortly after that and said, the cancer cord had been cut. So um, I knew I was on the right track, but it was a couple of years. They were giving me guidance, telling me, you know, what herbs to take, what to do. And so, in fact, one of the songs that they were playing in my head was, Do You Believe in Magic? And once I heard that song, I, I knew I was going to be okay and that I could trust it. And so... So spirit began to strip away this idea that I was some kind of athlete because after all, I could barely walk up the stairs. It hurt to walk up the stairs. It, it hurt to, to ride my bike. It hurt to do so many things. And I wasn't able to do a lot of those things with my son because I just physically couldn't do it. So when I was this athlete, I was no longer this athlete. I was just somebody that was trying to get by. And so the false identification began to be stripped away from me in different ways. And I'm sure we all had that experience, right? Spirit comes along and said, no, 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 it's not who you are. I, I know you think that's who you are. I know you want to be somebody. Maybe you want to be an artist or a singer or you know, a speaker or whatever it is. But let me assure you, you are not that. You are the divine in expression. And it just so happens that you're a speaker. For so many years in my life, uh, when I was listening to my teachers, what I was doing is I was learning from my teachers, but I was also learning in a way to say, how can I take this to my talk to make me a better speaker? And it was only really over the last few months, six months, I don't know, that I begin to realize, no, I'm approaching this wrong. It's not about becoming a better speaker. It's about becoming more present. And then from that presence and that essence of who I am, allow the words to, to be provided for the speaking. Do you see the difference of that? Because we're all trying to be the best at something. And it's fine. There's no judgment with that. We're all doing the best that we can. But sometimes we hook into something and we're trying to be the best at Well, the question is, why are we trying to be the best at that? Are we trying to do the best at that because we want to serve? Or maybe we're wanting to be the best because we want you know, our somebody to be somebody. We want our somebody is to, to be something that people look up to or admire or envy or whatever that is. But I would just offer to you, whatever you're trying to be the best at, it's okay. But can you just kind of just go within and say, am I being fully present at what I'm sharing and what's coming through me? That's the question. So this whole thing called arrogance, um, it's just been playing out in my life in so many different ways. And my brother has been a huge teacher for me because um, he has been the king of arrogance, you know. And I fought with him so much. Uh, we, I mean, you go to the family holidays and our family holidays were quite often were imbued with intense arguments between him and I. And I'm sure, even though nobody else said it, except for my wife and my son, who told me, like, why do you do that? You know, why do you engage, you know? Like, well, he, you know, well, of course it was wanting to be right. It always comes down to wanting to be right, you know? And so, in any case, um, my brother's been this, he's been this beautiful teacher for me. And we had a conversation the other day that was just so fantastic, but it started with, you know, a few years back, he started kind of preaching to me. Uh, we, uh, politically, we are just on opposite sides. And I finally just said to him, I go, Rob, look, I'm not interested in your opinions. And to be quite honest with you, I'm really not interested in anybody's opinions. I want something deeper. I want something that is experiential, you know, love, a piece and essence of who we are to be shared. There's nothing wrong with opinions, it's fine. But as one of my teachers said, there's nothing wrong with opinions unless you have an attachment to them. 
If you have an attachment to the opinion, then you're going to want to change other people's mind to think like you because you need this out, certain outcome. So in any case, I said that to him and he said, okay. And I'm like, oh, okay. Did he just say okay? So, but he did. And we stopped talking about politics because I said to him, I go, look, we both think we're right and we're trying to convince the other person they're right and we're not getting anywhere. In fact, the more you try to convince me, I'm probably digging my heels in more to say, no way. And I said, you're probably doing the same thing with me. And he said, you're absolutely right. We stopped talking politics. And the conversation the other day was, as I'm talking to him, we're talking about how we've grown each other. We've lost both our mom and our sister within the last two and a half years. And uh, dad died back in 92. But we're all we have left now. And we don't want to lose it. We're family. We grew up together. We bonded in so many ways. Even though we're different, we're so much alike. And so we're having this, this conversation. And I said... I don't know that there's been a better teacher for me in my life than you. I said, maybe Laura, my wife. But I said, I probably have learned more from you than anybody. And he said, well, probably not necessarily the way you wanted to learn. And I said, well, I fought it a lot of times. I fought it so much. There was a time I couldn't stand my brother. And in my dreams, I was just beating the hell out of him, honestly. I was fighting with him, physically fighting with him in my dreams. And he's always, in my dreams, he represented the head where I was the heart. But now when he's in my dreams, we're working together. You know, the head and the heart. And so I said, so I'm telling him this, that you, you know, I've not had a better teacher. And I said, I'm, I'm so grateful. And he said, what did he say? Well, he said, he, he alluded to something like, you know, uh, I know it's probably not the way you wanted to learn. And I said, I'm so grateful how it all played out. I truly am because it was exactly what I needed. And I said, and I feel like you've gained some things for me. He has much more of a compassion and understanding. I'm not going to go overboard on that because he could use a little more compassion at times. But he has changed so much. He has done his homework. And I'm just so grateful for that. We have so many opportunities for the world to teach us in humility. And... Without saying too much, probably the reference is probably enough to say, you know, world leaders, country leaders, we have a chance to look at those that we're judging and say, what is it about them that is reflecting back at me that I don't like? And I have to look at that all the time because when there's somebody that's just full of their ego and their arrogance, I might not be to that extreme but they are showing me something that I need to see. Like rather than, you know, we're so busy trying to change somebody or get them out of office or do something or keep them away from office or whatever it is. We're so busy trying to get the situation to be different rather than just saying, wait a minute, can I just take responsibility for my life here and acknowledge that there's something that is keeping me from loving and accepting this person exactly the way they are. They are our teachers. They might not be an easy teacher, but they are our teachers. And you know what? I have found that if I don't like the situation, the best thing for me to do is learn what I need to learn about it in order to transcend it. And change. And it has to change because the only reason God or life, whatever you want to call it, is giving us this experience is because there's something that we're lacking, something that we need to learn that God is saying, I'm not picking on you. I know you feel like that. I'm not picking on you. I am simply giving you what you need. So I've been getting what I need lately. I've been noticing that I'm, you know, uh, I'll participate some on social media. I, I post a lot of quotes on Facebook. Uh, I have a group called uh, Meditation and Mindful Moments about 
I don't know, 800 people or so. I post different quotes on there and I'll post on there and I'll post the other things, comments to people. And I thought, oh my God, I'm saying so many stupid things that are just so arrogant. And I, I, I'm like, why did I say that, you know? And then I go to change it and I go, I told my wife, I wouldn't show her what my remarks are because she'd probably be like, ooh, did you really say that on there, you know? But I was telling her, I didn't go back to change. I'm not changing my remarks. You can sit with it and I can sit with it. You can judge me if you want and, and honestly, it's okay. I'm gonna just sit with, be present with my need to have people love me or approve of me. And I'm just gonna sit with that feeling and that experience so that I can continue to recognize that is not the truth of me. But it is moving through my insecurities. So I've been having all these experiences of just saying things that I feel like are really stupid that I said, that are very arrogant that I said. And I was sharing that, I spoke at Unity of uh, Blue Water in Port Huron last week. And one of the guys said to me, he said, Brett, I think it's not that you, you all of a sudden become more arrogant, it's, because, it's that you become more aware of the arrogance that's there. And that, that feels true to me. I'm just becoming more aware of all the arrogant things that I've been doing. And I'm really grateful for that. It's not that it doesn't bring up the pain for me, but I'm really grateful that it is being highlighted in my life because I don't wanna stay that way. I wanna come from a place truly of being humble and, and have humility in what I share. And I know that part of that is that it needs to break down in me before that can happen. Um, I had something on the tip of my tongue and it, and it floated away there. So uh, I will let that go and, and see what else presents itself. I know what it was. It was, there was a gentleman in the audience that was watching Eckhart Tolle. And he said, I've been very arrogant and, and I'm not proud of that and I'm, I'm ready to move through it. This is my story. And Eckhart said to him, he said, as soon as you become aware that, you're, that the arrogance is there, you are no longer that. Please hear those words. Anytime you become aware of some kind of issue that you have identified with, with yourself, some kind of negative issues that said, this is a problem me, I need to be more kind, more patient, or more humble, whatever it is. When you become aware of that and you come back to the essence of who you are, which always, always, always resides in the present moment. When you reside in the present moment, the arrogance is no longer there. The, 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 the anger is no longer there. None of the negative emotions are no longer there because only the present mo moment exists. And in the present moment, nothing needs to be any different than what it is. It's only when we step out of that that it ends up being that way. That's our teaching. That is our teaching to say, you know, these things... So many times, like when we're talking about awakening to the truth of who we are, we're waiting for something to happen in our lives. Like for me, I love sugar. You've probably heard me say that before. And I have what, you know, what might be described as a sugar addiction. But what's been beautifully happening lately is, this is also from Eckhart Tolle, but I've heard it from my teacher and other teachers as well, is that when you have some kind of addiction or habit that's there and then you um, say, I gotta have this piece of chocolate cake. He, he used to say, do three conscious breaths before you eat it. You know, like, okay, let me just do a conscious breath and breathe it through, let it go, and then come back to the moment. And then if it presents itself again, I'll do another breath. And then if it presents itself again, I'll do a third breath. And on the fourth breath, I'm gonna go ahead and eat the cake and enjoy it. I've done my work. I've brought, brought it back and I've moved some of that energy through that says I need to have that. 
So, and some teachers might say, you know, do it three minutes or five minutes being conscious. So I've been doing that before. I didn't even want to do that because I just wanted my damn piece of chocolate cake. You know? I, didn't want, I didn't want to go through that process, you know, to take, no, because I, I just want it, you know. And now it's like, okay, I feel God pushing, you know, giving me some gentle nudges more and more, health issues, things like that. So I know I need to do something about that. And so my, what I'm doing about that is I'm noticing I'm really wanting to sugar. I'm hearing my mind say, yeah, I really want this right now. And I'm like, where's that coming from? It's just coming from old programming from my head, you know. Maybe having cake as a comfort food, satisfying, being with family or friends, whatever it is. It's like it's presenting itself, but it's not who I am. It's not the truth. So I'll notice that. I'll come back to the moment. And I'll practice doing it for about five minutes. And if it's still there, then I will say, I'm going to go ahead and eat it and enjoy it. And, and, and I do that. I enjoy it. And so, and I found spirit being very, very supportive of that because they see that I'm doing the work. And that's all that's being asked of any of us. Whatever it is, if it's arrogance or, you know, cake or some kind of addiction or habit that we have, we're being asked to... Pay attention to the thoughts, but don't buy into it as if it's the truth. Because as soon as you come back to the present moment, that issue is no longer there. So I'm going to leave you with this. I said we're always waiting for something to change. You don't need to wait for anything to change to come back to the present moment, to come back to who you are. You can have an addiction. You can have arrogance. You can have anger. You can have frustrations. You can have anything. But can you just notice that experience without needing to judge it or fix it or make it bad or wrong? Notice it and then just simply come back to the present moment. That's all that's being asked of us. And so what I used to say as, as the seeker of love and peace and joy and the truth of who I am, I don't feel I'm a seeker anymore. I feel I am what I've been looking for. And the mind might say, yeah, but you need to heal this, this, and this. So what? That's just the mind saying those things. You don't need to heal it. All you need to do is just simply be aware of it. Notice it. Notice that it's not who you are and then come back to the moment, come back to who you are. That is all that's being asked of you. I, I feel like that's everything. Thank you. Thank you. So Corey, if you would, a little meditation music, and if you would just, if you're open for it, closing your eyes. And if you could, just take a nice deep breath in. And just really letting go that there's anything you're holding on to. Mostly of yourself, but anyone else as, as well. And I, I'm, I'm being very sincere when I say this. Any judgment or blame that you have of yourself. And any judgment and blame you have of anyone else. I'm inviting you, just inviting you. Just let it go. Give it to God. Just let it go. Give it to the universe. Jesus, Buddha, whatever you want to do. But you don't need to hold on to that. You truly don't need to hold on to it. We've bought into this thing in the past that, you know, the shame and the guilt where we've made a mistake and we feel like we need to suffer from it or hold on to it in some way. Trust me when I say this. Life, God, will give us what we need when we need it. You don't need to store these things anymore. Starting right now, you don't need to store all this old baggage. You can literally let it go right now and trust that if something needs to be healed, it will be given to you in the most perfect way possible. And I'd like you to just bring your attention to your breath. Just notice your breath. 
Just notice that the breath happens all by itself. It doesn't need any help or support. And, and there's no effort even required in this meditation. None whatsoever. There's nothing to do. There's nowhere to go. Just simply be aware of your breath. That's all. It's so simple. And in this being aware, you begin to connect with the beingness, not the doingness, but the beingness of who you are, which is absolutely perfect. I know the mind might say, well, Brett, you don't know me. You don't know all the issues I have. And, and what I would say is, I really don't care what issues you have. I know that whatever issues are there, if you can just notice those, rather than being pulled into them as if they're the truth, just simply come back to the breath and the awareness. And every time it happens, come back to the breath and the awareness. That is your way out and that is your way in, into the very essence of who you are. And just taking another nice deep breath in and coming back to this present moment. Namaste, my friends. Namaste. service when we take a moment to, I always say, fill our hearts with gratitude, and I do mean that. Let's take it, take a moment to do that, just fill our hearts with gratitude for all of the blessings and gifts in our life, lives. It's um, wonderful to be aware of that, be aware of all these things in our lives, people in our lives, conditions and relationships. And I also want to be grateful to all of you, and I know we are grateful to each other for your generosity to the fellowship to allow us to have these Sunday afternoons together. Richard is going to come around with the basket today. And as I said uh, before, put your prayer cards in the basket, your donations, or if you donate online, hold your gift in consciousness. As we sing together, I am grateful.
clarity, wisdom, whatever is needed. And let us also send love and prayers to our country's leaders and all those involved in our political system because we are right in the thick of it now. And we can hold the love. We can be that beacon of light and love. And together we say, and so it is. Thank you. I'm going to ask Anara and Austin to come and do their second song. One of the places that I am most present is when I am among nature. And one of the places that also can remind me of being humble is in nature. And I think this song that Anara and I co-wrote together a very long time ago is, it speaks to that. Um, we started writing this song when she was only six. We went seven, she was seven. When we were on a vacation up in the Upper Peninsula in Marquette and we went swimming in Lake Superior. And there's nothing like a lake quite the size and coldness of Lake Superior to remind you of just how small you are. But this is, uh, this is called Swimming in Lake Superior.
So well, it's genetics, probably. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you for, for being here with us. And thanks to everyone who's here in this room, sharing their love with each other um, and with the fellowship. Thank you for those watching online. We include you in our hearts and in our love as well. Um, I have a few announcements, um, the usuals actually today. Death Cafe is coming up on July 22nd. That's a Saturday at 2 p.m. I just um, substituted for Reverend Julie um, at the Hannah Center on uh, Friday for the Death Cafe there. And it was such a wonderful conversation. And it occurred to me that it's not just about the topic. It's really too about the connection that we have with each other. When we're in a situation like that, talking about a topic that is so close to us. So if you have a chance to give, to give one a try, please do. Um, we also have healing movements every Monday at four with Julie. Chair yoga on Thursdays at four. Check out the healthy living videos that uh, Barbara Kinsey provides in our e-announcements. And remember, Potluck Sunday is coming up at the end of the month, the, the last Sunday of the month. And Sue, I want to check, are we having, yes, thumbs up for the Waldemar Walk Sunday, August 4th, 1230, uh, and that's on Sunday. And uh, I think Sue would like everyone to give that a, a try, too. It's, it's a wonderful opportunity, again, to connect with each other and nature. So let us join together in our peace circle and say our closing blessing together. Yeah. 
Let this be my joyous vow to take each moment and live each moment in peace eternally. Let there be peace on earth and let it.